Hey, and welcome to The Short Stuff. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and Jerry's here too. Dave's here in spirit. When you put us all together, you can call us the Blue Man Group. <laughs> Terrible. It's the best I could come up with on short notice, Chuck. Yeah, this is the, uh, I guess, the conclusion of our two-part series on uh, colors, although we have done colors in the past. I know we did Indigo, mm-hmm. and I think we did a short stuff on paint blue, right? Yes, and some other stuff it's come up and and some other things but i think colors is going to be a never-ending suite there's a lot of colors to cover (laughs) that's right uh and this is a story of not only a color but a a process uh and we're talking about the color prussian blue and that is the color of a blueprint like in the old days when blueprints were really blue like blueprints for a house or a building or a bridge right or a tank or whatever you're going to design that blue is called prussian blue yeah, and I mean, if you go and look up blueprints um, up to about the f- 50s, I would say you are going to find actual blue blueprints, like you said. And there was a guy named John Herschel. He was an English astronomer, chemist, and photographer. And this was back when photographer was really something. This was eight, the 1840s. In 1842, yeah. he figured out that um, Prussian blue is photoreactive, meaning that when you expose it to light, you can get Prussian blue. And he figured out that you could use that chemical reaction to make copies of things. It's extraordinarily clever. And I think John Herschel deserves to be in the Inventors Hall of Fame for this. Is he not? I don't know. Okay. (laughs) If he is, he deserves to be there. If not, he deserves to be there. Uh, I agree. So this is the process. It's called cyanotype. And it was what early photographers used. In fact, the very first um, published photography book was made with cyanotype. Yeah, that was, um, by the way, that was by Anna Atkins, whose 1843 book, Photographs of British Algae, get this, Chuck, colon, cyanotype impressions. Amazing. Uh, So all of a sudden, architects and engineers were all over this stuff as well because they realized hey, if you can make a photograph using this uh, cyanotype process, Mm -hmm. you can make a copy of something, and we're really tired of redrawing everything over and over. (laughs) Right, exactly. So um, the process involves producing blue ferric ferrous cyanide. That's the chemical name for Prussian blue. And you'll notice there's a lot of ferric stuff in there. That means it's made from iron salts, but it also has cyanide in it. And just from this um, researching this episode, Chuck, I finally understood what cyan as a blue refers to. It's referring to cyanide. Yeah. Did you know that already? No. Oh, well, I thought that was pretty cool. That's awesome. But if, if you take a, a drawing of something and you can put it on something that's basically see-through, these days they use like clear plastic if you're doing something like this, and you have a line drawing, and you put that line drawing on top of a paper that's been treated in blue ferric ferrous cyanide, and these ions, iron salts that make that, and you expose it to light, then that the paper beneath that's treated in the Prussian blue turns blue in every place except for where those lines were on top of it. Yeah, so it's like a photo image in a dark room. And in fact, you have to do it in a dark room, uh, just like you would a photograph. So that's why, you know, they would draw it in regular ink on paper, and then the reverse negative image of that would be white drawing on blue paper and a really nice-looking blue. Yeah, yeah, it's a gorgeous blue. Prussian blue is fantastic. Yeah, man, I saw, I was typing in Prussian blue things and I uh, saw some suit jackets, some wool suit jackets. Prussian blue, gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. you'd look like a member of the Prussian army from the 19th century. <laughs> That's right. That's why they named it that, right? Yeah. Do you want to take a break and then come back and talk about where your Prussian blue came from? Let's do it. Well, now, when you're on the road, driving in your truck, why not learn a thing or two from Josh and Chuck? It's Stuff You Should Know. Stuff You Should Know. All right. So Prussian blue finds its origins in the laboratory of an alchemist and a dye maker of all places. It's a pretty cool place for a a new thing to be created, especially something as beautiful as Prussian blue. And the alchemist was a guy named Johann Conrad 
Dippel. How would you say Conrad in, in German, Chuck? Mm, that's probably right. Conrad or Conrad? I don't know, actually. Okay. Well, we'll just call him Mr. Dippel. <laughs> he was the alchemist. Uh, Herr Dippel. Herr Dippel, yeah. yeah. He was the alchemist, um, and the dye maker was a guy named uh, Diesbach. We're just going with Mr. Dies or Herr Diesbach for this guy. And they shared this lab in, in Berlin, and by sharing a lab and sharing one another's or using, like, borrowing, I should say, a cup of one another's, you know, ingredients here or there, they mm -hmm. ended up accidentally creating Prussian blue. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, the chemist was working on um, medicines, like elixirs and things. Mm -hmm. And Diesbach, as a dye maker, was great at making these dyes. And as the story goes, he was making a uh, deep red dye one day mm -hmm. when he borrowed some potash from his chemist friend. And that turned it into this wonderful, wonderful Prussian blue. He went back in, hair dipple, and said, I got to figure out what this stuff is. And he figured out the secret was that the potash had ox blood. And when he mixed that with the iron sulfate, that caused this amazing blue to, uh, what does it do? Does it unveil itself? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, great way to put it. <laughs> so Prussian blue has unveiled itself. And at, at first they called it Berlin blue. And it only became known as Prussian blue later on because it was used to dye the uniforms of the Prussian army in the early 19th century. Um, and depending on what part of the continent you were on or whether you were on the continent at all, uh, calling it Prussian blue was either a term of endearment or a term of disparagement because the Prussians helped save the British's cookies at Waterloo and defeated Napoleon. So if you were French, you didn't think very highly of the Prussians or their blue. If you were English, it was a term of endearment because you were really grateful to the Prussians for coming and saving the day there. That's right. And it became a uh, just a popular color. Like artists loved using it, um, printmakers loved using it. it. Obviously, these architects loved the the result of using it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if they especially loved the color. That was just kind of what color blueprints turned out to be. Right. But I'm sure they were fine with it. Um, but Herschel died before that blueprinting process uh, was born. I think five years later is when the actual architectural blueprint process that is unfortunately gone because I, I think it looks really neat. Uh, these days you're not going to find that because uh, over the years uh, a lot of different things happened to either make it fall out of fashion or just make it cheaper and safer and easier to make copies in different ways. I would bet that there's some hipster artisan architectural firm that, <laughs> that still uses this process now. You think? has gone back to it. Yeah. But the reason that it has largely been abandoned is because it's a very um, labor-intensive and time-intensive process, uh, even if you're using kind of updated machinery. Yeah. And other processes came along that seemed to do a better job. And plus also, I, I don't know if everybody's like, we're sick of the blue or whatever, because there's another process called uh, Diazo White Press. And it does the same thing, but it gives you like um, black or gray lines on a white background. And that's kind of what the what the um, architectural plans look like today. They don't look blue anymore. And then shortly after that, they came up with zero graphic copiers, which you just today call a copier. And I didn't realize this either, Chuck. They're called zero graphic because this is a dry process, like zero, like dry, like zero scaping. Uh -huh. It's a dry process because you don't have to wet the paper that is receiving the image like you do when you're using um, the old Prussian blue cyanotype process. Yeah, and I think that's how Xerox got their name, right? Yeah, for sure, which is a proprietary eponym. Yeah, and I thought uh, I thought the Diaso process created blue lines. Is that not true? I think later on they figured out that if you use blue lines on the original, it it makes a cleaner line okay. on the copy. That's what that was my take on it. All right, and I think that was sort of like in the seventies, and then in the early two thousands is when uh, the Diazzo process started to kind of fade away because um, you know ammonia is not something you want to be working with a lot, mm -hmm. and there are also regulations that increased is in working with ammonia. And then, you know, the digital revolution came along, print technology, the things that were um, cheaper, basically, and smaller. All of a sudden, you didn't have to have some huge, like, plot printer in your office to make something like this. Mm -hmm. 
And it just, you know, it, it did like everything. It became cheaper and smaller and faster. Yeah, and I think the printers that can print out, you know, like regulation size architectural plans or engineering plans, those became more affordable too. And they're basically just Xeroxes. They're like printers, essentially, just bigger size. One thing I did see, Chuck, that I didn't realize, um, pen plotters. It's like a contraption originally where you have a pen and connected to that pen is a bunch of other pens. And so when you're drawing on one paper, the other pens are drawing on their own paper. So you're making copies like that as you're drawing in the first place. Those have come back and they're now computerized. Yeah, plotters are super cool. Mm -hmm. I, had a, I had a friend years ago that was a sign maker and he would, you know, these these plotters would cut out uh, these designs from the computer files. And it's just really cool to see those things, you know, that automation at work. Yeah. Uh, even for like a, a small business, you know, he was like a team of one. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention too is I think the Diazzo's faded in sunlight. Oh, okay. Uh, which it was fine for a little while because apparently it takes, you know, like a few months, which was enough if you're, you know, if it's like a house plan or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't need it to last forever, but eventually they were like, you know, we should probably make something a little more permanent. That connects some dots for me because I saw on some archivist website that they do not recommend using the Diazzo print because it isn't, it's so impermanent. Now there I know. you have it. Knowing's half the battle, as they say. Cyan. Cyan. Chuck said cyan. I followed up with a cyan too. And everybody, that means short stuff is out. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.